I had a, um, a fun experience um, it was last fall, right, at BYU. I was doing a signing or something. Anyway, Peggy came through, who was one of my former students, and I do my normal thing where I'm like, oh, how's your writing going, former student? She said, actually, it's going really well. Um, I have an agent, and you have a sale, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so that's always nice to hear. So she joined the group of, um, the small group who have gone on to actually publish professionally from the class. And so I invited her in to speak to you guys about how she went about doing it and how her experience differed from mine. Because as I've said, my experience getting published is now almost a decade old. And yours happened last year? In November, right? November, right, right then. So, um, so you can get kind of um, a quick view of how it goes for someone in today's market. So I'm actually going to just let Peggy Cool just taking over right now and, and going at it. Okay. Um, let's turn on the lights for you up here at the front. Okay. Uh, my name is Peggy Edelman. I first came to this class three years ago. Where is that? There it is. Those are not very intuitive. <laughs> <laughs> did I leave something off? Oh, I just. I wonder which one that was. I think that was like the second one you did. Second one. Right. There we go. Okay. All right. Um, so I first came to run this class three years ago, um, and I was just auditing the class. And. Um, I was so glad to come to this class because I knew that that was the step that I needed to take to become published. It's not the only step, obviously, but I knew that that was what was going to get me up to the next platform. So I was so grateful to be able to come to this class because really, I, how long have you guys been in this class? Just a few weeks, right? Yeah. Uh, a month yeah. or so? Yeah, about a month and a half, I guess. Because uh, most authors, even really good ones, cannot tell you how they do it. They've just taken all that knowledge and then they, they go. but. The amazing thing about Brandon is because he can tell you exactly, breaking everything down to tell you. And I learned so much. I would say I've learned more than Brandon than I have from everybody else combined as far as writing goes. Checks um, in the mail, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> what? Checks in the mail, thank you. <laughs> okay, and then he divides us up into writing groups. Um, and that went really well for us because we got to try out the people in our writing group and see who we worked well with and see who we didn't. Um, there were three of us in my writing group that we found work really well together, and um, so we decided to get together as a group afterwards along with the, the TA in the class. Rob is hiding outside, right? Is that Rob out there? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he was a TA. So anyway, we, we got along well, so we decided to get together as a writing group. And we're still meeting every week three years later and still submitting a chapter a week, just like we did when we were in Brandon's class. And... Um, this is a great chance for you guys to get to know people in your group and see how well you work together because if you don't have a writing group, your chances, I've heard this, this once, it's something like 10% to get published. And if you stay with a writing group, it goes up to something crazy like 90%. So get with a writing group and stay with it because not only will they keep you motivated, but they can keep you on track too. Um, so anyway, our, our group's been meeting very nicely and then... Um, I, after I finished the book that I was writing when I started this class, um, by the time I got to the end of it, it was the end was so much better written than the beginning because I learned so much during the course of that book that I, it was a little daunting to even deal with it. So I just put it away, went on to the next idea, finished that, but really is where it made a big difference was in revisions. Um, and I know that revisions are a pain, but I don't, there's so many things you have to focus on when you're doing a book, like making your characters likable, working on character arcs, the plot arcs, all of the, the subplots, everything. There's so many things you have to keep in your mind. I don't think there's anyone that can keep all of those in their mind the first time through. So every time you go through a revision, it's going to get better and better and more layered, and the more layered it gets, the more real the world is going to be. So um, I just kept on going through and figuring out more things, and everything I read and everything I heard, I would do it in the con context of my own book and figure out what I needed to change. And it's gone through 12 revisions now, and it feels really good. So then I was ready to go to the next step. Um, I, oh, my query, queries are another huge thing because some agents think they can tell everything from a query, and they probably can't. And so, no, they can't. Huh? No, they can't. Not everything, but yeah. they can tell a lot about your writing style, how much of a rambler you are, or how much you can get to a concise point, how good you are with language, a lot that they can. And some of them think they can tell everything, so they will not even look at anything else if they, don't, if they can't get past your query. So a lot of agents, though, 
if they don't say on their um, website, only send me the query, you can still paste five pages below your query into the body of your email, never do it as an attachment. Unless they say not to, you can. And so it's a really helpful way for them to get a look at your writing itself because queries are hard. They're really, really hard. But they're also worth the time to spend getting them right. Um, last May, I went to store makers, and conferences are a really, really good way to go. Um, anyway, at store makers, I got a pitch session with Sarah Crow. And I wasn't going to even do a pitch session because um, I'm really not good at pitching. And I thought I'd much better just writing it and sending it to her than I am fumbling in a pitch. But then someone talked me into it, so I got on the waiting list and got into her. Um, Sarah Crow is Dan Wells' agent, um, as well as, as several other local authors' agents. Mm -hmm. I can't remember who else she has. But it's I Rob's know too, right? It's Rob's, Rob's yeah. Rob's. And Bruce Eschler, Marion Jensen. Okay. Not Mayberry, but he's not local. Right. Um, anyway, she's a really good agent, but I had learned how to pitch in a conference, and they say get it down to like a two sentence or even three sentence pitch, and they go in there, give your pitch, and then they'll ask you questions. So that's exactly what I did. I went in and sat down with her said my pitch, and she's like, oh, that sounds really good. And then there was this really long, awkward silence. <laughs> and then she said, uh, why don't you send me your full? And so then I said, yeah. okay. What and was your pitch when you gave us the pitch? Being, Do you have oh the pitch, gosh, remember? I remember? I don't remember that one. Okay. It's, it's a post-apocalyptic adventure about a 12-year-old girl, Hope, who with her town lives in one of the burnt-out craters left behind by one of the massive green bombs that destroyed most of the Earth's population. Bandits come and invade. She has to save the town with her friends. Anyway, um, so it was really awkward, and it was over in about a minute and a half. And then I'm like, all right, see you then, and left. <laughs> okay. When you sign up for a pitch session, you bought 10 minutes with that agent, and you can spend them however you want. And I wish I had known that before I'd gone in there. Um, Erin, who's also in our group, who was in this class, she took in her first few pages of her book and said, tell me when you would stop reading this. And so then she read until she got to that point and then talked about what had stopped her and, and how to go from there. People have taken in their queries and asked for a, a query critique. Um, I heard somebody else who had gone in with story ideas and pitched the story ideas to see which ones most interested her and which ones most um, she thought would be able to sell the best. So use that time however you want and don't go in unprepared like me and fumble and leave after a minute and a half. Um, Sarah had requested bulls, though, I think from pretty much everyone who pitched. So I didn't leave there thinking, yay, I made it. Um, so I worked on my, uh, my query for five months before I sent it out. And then um, the first three I sent it out to were agents that I didn't really think were a good match. Because sometimes it's really hard to send off those first queries and to get to figure out how to personalize it and to get all the wording right. So it's nice to be able to query somebody that if they don't say yes, you're not crushed about. Um, and that's the trick too, is every agent knows you're querying a bunch of other people, but they want to feel like they are the only one. Like you handpick them out of everybody and you just think that the two of you are the perfect match. Because you've had a chance to research them beforehand and they haven't had a chance to research you. So if you include in that first paragraph, something that personalizes why you chose them as an agent, why you think they're going to be a good fit. Because this is someone you're going to have to work with, so it needs to be somebody that you can work well with. So letting them know what it is that you that made you think that they would be a good match with you is what you need to put in that beginning. Um, I got an offer from an agent to do exclusive revisions. Um, she is an agent that was really, really heavy on, or she used to be an editor before she was an agent, so she really likes to revise heavily with her authors, and, and it's her normal thing to want to do exclusive revisions first. So basically it meant that it would come off the table for everyone else, and I would work with her for a few months to get the book to where, it, where she wanted it, and then, we'd, then she would offer representation, and then go on submission again. So the thing, she was not, she was a really good agent really good and on paper it was a match made in heaven but it was talking to her on the phone I could tell that it was anything but and it was not a good idea to be with her and really it matters I know when you want an agent 
you're pretty much willing to take anybody who wants to to work with you, but it is not, I mean, you've really got to find someone. I have a friend who, her agent was Nathan Bransford. I don't know if any of you guys know him. He was a really well-run agent, and he quit the business. And so she just got handed over to another agent in their agency. So they never picked each other, and it was an awful, awful thing, and she just broke up with her agent yesterday after a really long, oh, hard... <laughs> she almost said on Valentine's Day, and I guess she decided to wait till the next day. <laughs> but it was it was a hard thing that set her back by a couple of years. Um, so it is really really important. So if you're getting a feeling that this might not be a good matchup, listen to those feelings. But um, at first, I was just excited because she wanted to do exclusive revisions, and so she said, "So think about it. You've got to let any other agents that have it know and get back with me." So then I sent Sarah an email because she had my full because she'd requested it. And um, I just sent her a message saying, I have an offer to do exclusive revisions. Are you um, interested before I commit? And so then she just emailed back and said, can I have the weekend? And so I gave her the weekend. She called on Monday and, and offered to represent me. Um, Sarah gets a ton. Just like really good agents, she gets a ton and does a ton of requests for full. So it takes her forever to get a full or to go through and read a full. Um, but it was that offer from the other agent that lit that fire that got me bumped up to the top spot. So it helps a lot to meet somebody because, and to pitch to somebody because a lot of times it will get you past that querying stage and into them requesting the first three chapters or requesting the full. And that is a huge thing because then when somebody else requests it, you can say another agent already has this. And once they know that it, there's going to be a competition and then they know that they need to act quicker and they need to figure out if that's something that they want a lot faster. And so that, it, mine was kind of a combination of going through meeting somebody and then going through cold querying. Because the first agent, I was just cold query. I knew nothing about her besides what I had found online. So um, both, I think, are really effective ways that can help you. you know, either way can get you in just as well. Um, something I was going to say about agents, no, I don't remember what it's going to be. Does anyone have any questions about anything? She, some agents will say, um, have you revise a lot? Some agents will not. Sarah was not one that had me revise a lot. Um, so the book that you just signed with is the post-apocalyptic one, right? Mm -hmm. What's the title of it? Through the Bomb's Breath. Um, so the first agent wanted me to revise a lot. Sarah did not. In fact, when I asked about some of the revisions, she said, no, I think that's the wrong way to go. And then, um, so, okay, well, one more thing about getting your manuscript ready. Um, I know there's a lot of times you think, oh, I'll wait and see what they think about this, or I'm going to copy a will we'll fix all my grammar problems, or you think some of these things are going to be fixed along the way, so you can ignore them now. But when someone is reading your manuscripts, anything that, you know how when you're reading a book, and it's fine until you hit that one little spot and you just kind of ignore it and shove it off to the side because it's just some little thing that bugs you. But the more things that bug you as you go, the more you're just like, I don't care about this book anymore. But you don't want an agent or an editor doing that same thing. And the thing is, is all those things that you think, oh, they'll fix it when they get to this point, it's not any they in there. It's you. So um, eventually they're going to say, okay, you need to fix these things. And it's then you're doing it on a deadline instead of doing it on your own terms. So get your manuscript as best as you can possibly get it and go listen to all the critiques that you get because it will really make a difference in what goes on later down the road. I just got my editorial letter while we were at LTUE, which it's kind of hard when you come home brain fried to an editorial letter. It was nine pages of suggestions. Have you talked about the sale? Oh, the sale. What? Who did you sell it to? Oh, How Random House. It was a preempt, um, which it, it went a little faster than what is normal. Um, yeah, you got the offer. The you got offer for representation when October sixteenth, and you got um, the offer from a publisher when November nineteenth. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I yeah, that's a little bit fast. I, I really assumed that. I would revise during November, mm -hmm. do nothing during December because, you know, nobody's December. works, yeah. And it would go on submission in, in January. Mm -hmm. So Sarah had sent me her revisions, which took two hours to do. And I just assumed that um, 
I had assumed that I would do it, but I, I talked to her on November 1st and told her my plan, and she's like, no, I think, I think right now is the, the best time, as soon as you can get it to me. And really, it's got to be by the 9th. If we don't do it by the 9th, we're going to have to wait. So I'm like, oh my gosh. So I spent days just getting it absolutely perfect, sent it to her on a Monday, which or Sunday night, which is like the 6th. The Monday morning when I woke up, there was a couple more things for her to, to change, little things. I sent it to her, and Tuesday morning she said, okay, it's in the hands of editors. And she gave me a list of who she was submitting it to. And then Friday, the editor from Random House called her and said, I'm interested, is it still available? And she's like, it's been a submission since Tuesday, yeah, it's still available. And then on Monday she said, oh yeah, remember that synopsis for book two that I told you you had weeks to do? Um, you need to do that now. And so I said, okay, well, can I take it to my writing group Tuesday night and then get it to you Wednesday? And she said, yeah, that's fine. And then she called on Tuesday while I was at work, like repeatedly until I got away where I could answer the phone. She said, Random House wants to make an offer. Um, I need it today. And I'm like, oh my God. So I went like, anyway. I, so I did a three-page synopsis and a query um, all on that night, 16 hours from when she told me till when I had to have it in sleeping time included. And I got the three-page tour that night, and I'm like, oh, this query's broken. I don't even know how to fix it because my brain's too tired. Can it wait till morning? And she said yes. So I sent it to her at 7.03 the next morning. She called or emailed at 7.20 saying it was in the hands of Random House, and by 9 o'clock she called me with a deal. <laughs> um, so, so it went fast. It was it was hard getting it that done that fast. But um, do you have contracts yet? Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. They're, they're, they're on the ball. <laughs> Tour takes like eight months for contracts. I, I would die, especially if they didn't let you announce. Because yeah. some some agents don't like you to announce until right, you've got until your you contract. So you have yeah. to keep that information quiet. Sarah's like, hey, how about we announce Monday? Um, so I sat on it for like three days or something ridiculous. Um, but anyway, it was a preempt, and what that means is Random House came in quick with an offer so that other people wouldn't come in and then it gets sent to auction. So if it gets sent to auction, then it drives the advances up, stuff like that. So a preempt is when they're coming in saying, we want it right now, and if you will take the chance of going with us, then, um, you know whatever. We'll make you the deal right now. Um, and Sarah had said, I think, she said, before you make a decision on whether to, you know, let it go to auction or take the preempt, I want you to talk to the editor. And so I got to talk to her on the phone, and I could tell by talking to her that um, the vision they had for the book and what they, where they wanted to push it and what they were going to do for marketing and stuff like that, um, that it was the perfect fit. She was somebody that I could work with really well and not uh, just somebody I could talk to like a normal person. Because when it's your editor and you're dealing with so many things, you don't want to be afraid of your editor. Um, and they offered lead title too, which I think I'm going to turn that down, lead title from around the house. So um, anyway, that was yeah. the deal. There Any other go. questions? How has that been working with your editor and your house? Like what kind of, how many revisions have you guys done? Well, I just got my editorial letter Friday, so it, it was a lot. She, she gave me nine pages, and it goes through telling a bunch of things, and they could be difficult. There was a lot of things like deeper into this character motivation and look at relationship parallels here. It wasn't like go to page 57 and make this transition smoother. You know, it isn't things like that at first. Um, my editor's been great because she said, if you even fix nothing at all, I'll still be proud to publish this book. So fix whatever resonates with you. Some editors are not that easygoing. Um, and some can go through rounds and rounds and rounds of edits. And some are on a tighter schedule. I am luckily not on a tight schedule because um, it's a fall release. And so since we're already past fall, it's not till a year from September before it comes out. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how many we'll go through. What's your editor's name? Shana Corey. I've heard of uh, some situations where there are, what's the word on uh, pseudo uh, agents out there, agents that you wouldn't want to be with. Are there any things that you know of that you advise keeping an eye out for at agents or people that are posing as agents? But well, first off, if they ask you, um, 
for any money. And do not run away. Do run away from those because that's not a real agent. Um, ask them about their sales because you want people who have sold in your genre and in your age group because just because they're a good agent for um, there's a, a girl I know whose agent is really good at selling adult romance but she is a YA contemporary and she's had a really hard time selling it because that agent doesn't have the contacts for her for her story so you want to make sure that they've sold in yours uh, there's a lot of ways to go out and, and search for agents I took the cheaters way and went through publishers marketplace it's a $20 a month um, fee but I got the first five days free, I'm guessing that's normal, I'm just to get, try signing up and see if you get the first five days free. But um, it has a thing in there where you can list deal makers. So I just went and listed all the deal makers that were agents for middle grade and it showed me the top 100. So I just started researching there, I just started from the top and went down and, and researched every one of them. Um, I, if you're not sure about your query, I would say maybe not even um, start with your number one dream agent first because you want to see how your query works. I had reworked and reworked my query for five months and I knew I'd gotten to the point where there was no way I could make it any better. If it wasn't good enough, then I wasn't good enough yet and my book wasn't good enough. So I was pretty confident that it was the best I could get it. So I just started from the top and went down. So figure out where you're at with your query and where your comfort level is because it will determine where you're at. Some people like to do, like send out five at a time, do like two from their top, two from the middle, two and one from their bottom or something like that. I just went through agents and as I read about them and what they liked and what kind of a person they were, I just gave them a rank between one and 10. And so then after, you know, I just moved their names, their ranks to see who I wanted to query. But um, literary rambles is an excellent blog to go to because they um, have, have information on all of the top agents, and pretty much all the really, really good ones they have. Um, and they have everything gathered into one place, like all of their interviews, like things they've said about what kinds of things they're looking for, and lots of links to go to. The only caveat on literary rambles is that it's middle grade and YA focused. Oh. So they do do other stuff, but literary rambles is focused on Google section. Very good for me. Yes, they are That's good to know, though, because most of the resources I've given people are not middle grade and YA, because that I don't, I'm not as familiar with those, so it's, it's, it's good to know. It's probably the most brilliant resource you could use if you're writing YA or middle grade. There we go. They've really gotten everything together, so if you're using that. Um, are you actively blogging um, and things like that? Yes. I started a blog right after Storymakers last year, so like last June. And um, I blog five days a week because I wanted to grow my blog audience as quickly as possible and everyone I've seen go big has, has posted five days a week, but you really don't have to. The key is consistency. And if you decide you want to do once a week or three times a week or two times a week, just as long as you're doing it consistently. And then going out to other blogs is how you build your audience. It's when you create a blog and put it out there, the world doesn't know. There's no big sign going that says, hey, my blog's here, come check it out. So really the only way for you to advertise your blog is just by going to other blogs that are similar to yours because if you like them, chances are they're going to like you. And so if you just comment and become a follower of that blog, it's very likely they're going to follow you back to yours and then, you know, if they're liking what you do, that you know, they might just become a follower and never see you again. They might just keep on coming back because they've liked what you've done. Okay, sorry, I'm a little bit confused on the whole idea of blogging. I mean, what is, I mean, do you just talk about whatever you want to, or? It depends. To... Some people just talk about really random things. I keep it writing focused, so pretty much everybody who follows my blog are writers. Um, find what works for you. It takes a bit to find your blogging voice. We'll talk about blogging in the class. Okay. But I'll tell you, it has made a difference for me. Um, it is not a big deal to Sarah but it was to Shana, my editor. It gave her a chance to come out and see what I'm like. So she could tell if it was a personality she would get along with before she ever made the offer. And they came out. In fact, when I went on submission, I had tons of New Yorks <laughs> and tons that showed like Simon & Schuster, or Harper Collins, things like that coming to my blog. It makes a difference. And then all of a sudden I started getting like Harper Collins in the UK. And so I asked my agent, like, what, what is up with that? She's like, oh yeah, I've been talking to them. They, they come and look. They really do. And if you don't have a blog, they will Google you and find wherever you are. It doesn't have to be a blog. It can be Twitter, Facebook, whatever social networking you are. But they, 
they will come and find you to get a sense of who you are, how professional you are, how much they think that they can, um, I don't know, just to get a sense of, of you. What is your blog? Um, it's my name, Peggy Edelman. Would you like to write it on the board? Dot com. Yes, my name is hard to write or spell. Man, your handwriting is really good. Oh. And and yes, my post today had a picture of Brown in it. I was on Jeopardy two days ago. Did you guys see me? <laughs> <laughs> I was one of the one of the clues. Really? Yes. <laughs> What's that? You're in the news today for memory of life. Oh yeah, because the release date. Yeah. I managed to bring down Tor.com um, and Dragon Mount, so that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> they released the the release date and they posted it, so of the last one. They should give you an award for that. Mm. Bring down their site. Bring down their site, that's right. Um, have you quit your job yet? I did, like two weeks ago. Because it gets really busy. Really busy. Once you get a sale, it's a hard decision. But most authors I've known have said that they wish they would have quit a little sooner. So quitting you need to do is probably a good idea. Um, it depends on how big the advance is and things like that. But if you absolutely, if you can survive, on it, then you probably should because it gets really busy really fast. And really, the more you put into your book yeah. and promotion and everything, the more you will get out of it. So you can put in as little as you want, but if you're not putting in much, your yeah. publisher is not going to put in much either because they're like, oh, it's not going to take them too far if they're not helping out. It makes a huge difference how much you do. You're better off quitting your job if you can survive and blogging five days a week and getting to work on the next book. and trying to make school contacts so you can do school visits when your book comes out, all of those sorts of and things. writing conferences. Writing and conferences and going to classes like this. And you get tons more emails of people asking for things. Yeah. And, and just general keeping relationships with people in the business. Cause By the way, when Peggy's book comes out, if you're writing middle grade, you probably want to buy and read it because that will tell you what type of book sells in one week in today's <laughs> literary market. Any other questions? How long were you working on this book? I am a slow writer. Um, I'm trying to not be. <laughs> but it took me 10 months to draft it, and then I probably spent another 10 revising. So, um, well, do you know what? It wasn't 10 revising, because a lot of that I just stopped to work 100% of my time that I had to spend on that on blog building, going out to other blogs, getting my blog up, looking professional and nice and stuff like that. Um, and that was probably three months, so probably more like seven months. Kind of a related question. Just mm -hmm. to quantitatively visualize it, how much in a day would you usually produce to make it, to get to the finished product? You're talking like hours writing? Mm -hmm. I don't write every day. I, I realize that I am a chunk writer, and if I don't have too long of a time, like if I only have an hour a day, I can't get in it and be very effective in that hour. So I lump together, like I do all blogging in one day, and then I lump together all other types of stuff and lump together writing. Um, now it's more like probably 15 hours a week um, writing. Before it, it was less than that. I don't know. I, w I was more doing a chapter a week, because that's what my writing group gets and that's kind of the speed I went because I probably would have gone slower than that if they hadn't been wanting it every week and needing it. Which is another good thing about writing group. I wouldn't have gotten to this point when I did if they hadn't been pushing me along. And when you uh, got with your writing group originally when you guys kind of organized, did you all know that you were going to stick around for three years in the future? We, we were in it, totally. We were all completely dedicated to staying with it and we all knew that if we stayed as a group together, that we would rise up together and be celebrating each other's successes in writing. So I, the nice thing about staying with a group for a long time is you do all get on the same level. And and so and you do bring each other up as you go because everybody's learning as they go, so it really helps to bring them up. Um, so yeah, we were all we were all in it. In it it's not a coincidence that C. S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien were in a writing group together. A lot of writing groups form little enclaves 
It's also not a coincidence that in my writing group we now have three published writers um, because you do help each other out, bring each other up, and make contacts through one another. All right. Thanks, Peggy. Give her a hand, guys. <laughs> we'll have you teach in this class in a few years. Thank you Thank very you. much for coming. Appreciate it. Yep. Okay. I'm putting up with my scatterbrainedness. You're awesome. We are going to talk about plotting today. Yay, plotting. Boy, wow. <laughs> How often do you go into a classroom and say, we're going to talk about plotting, and people say, oh, yeah. Oh boy! <laughs> Excitement and joy! It's time for the plot lecture. Um, <clears throat> so, I'm going to talk to you about three or four different ways that writers I know construct their stories. Um, the thing you have to understand about this is none of these are in it, by any means all inclusive. None of these are the be all and end all. These are all tools as I always say, that you can use or discard. I always worry that um, writers will look too much at these sort of tools and think, this is what I have to do. Um, and for some writers, that will be useful to have that framework. For other writers, the this is what I have to do could ruin your writing. There is no have to do. But these are good ways to look at writing, particularly sp plotting, if you're having issues with it. The first one we're going to talk about is, is um, a very simple one we call the three-act format. Three-act format is a, um, came out of screenwriting. It's primarily a Hollywood methodology of storytelling. And three-act focuses on just lumping your book into three parts, your story into three parts. You have These beautiful squares, which are completely all the same size. Um, you have Act 1. It's often said this is the introduction. The Act 2, Escalation. And Act 3, Climax. All right. Another way of looking at this often is um, Act 1. Um, chase your hero up a tree, act two, throw rocks at them, act three, cut the tree down. Um, that's, uh, that's, how a lot, that's how some screenwriters talk about the concept. What this one is, basically that you were looking at these big transitions as ways to, um, to view your story. Generally, your introduction is, um, your act one is the reaction. Um, act two is um, the hero tries and makes things worse. And then act three is um, pulls it out by the skin of the teeth. Or fails. That does not happen very often in the Hollywood um, structure of this. Um, and so you usually look at that transition from Act 1 to Act 2 as tra Act 1 is your reaction chapter. We've talked about c passive characters and things like this. In the three-act format, usually your Act 1, your character is being chased. Um, you can see this really well in, um, in the Lord of the Rings films, right? Act 1 is a lot of Frodo getting chased. Act 2 kind of right here is the, um, the I, Frodo steps up and says, I will take the ring, I'll do it, um, which we call the call to action. Um, act two is they struggle and try and things get worse. It kind of breaks down a little bit with the Lord of the Rings because the, you're not sure if it's one film or three films. Um, but act three is, okay, you know, um, we survived this horrible thing, you know, whatever. Gandalf is at, at Gandalf's death, act two, but we're, we pull through and we're going to continue on. That would be your three-act structure for... Um, for the Lord of the Rings films, right? Or for the first one. Um, hard to say on that one because of the, um, the whole, um, uh, the whole three movies, which one is a film, which one is which film. But you, know, you can see it for Star Wars. Someone break this down for the first Star Wars film for me. What's act one? Luke's on Tatooine. He's, Luke's on Tatooine. Running away. Running away. Act two. 
They go to the Death Star and they actively go and get the princess, right? There is no more, you know, we're not being chased now. We are, but we're actually doing something. But lo and behold, we get the princess. But what happens? Ben Kenobi dies. Everything's awful. And um, we're about to get blown up. Act three, we somehow pull it out, right? Um, this is your, your basic structure for this type of story. Um, there's usually a transition right here as well, um, which is the, this is kind of the point of everything is awful. It's like the, this can't possibly get worse. I think you just answered my question. It was like, yeah. where's the belly of the whale thing that people talk about? Right, the belly of the whale is, um, this is, um, we will talk the about that one more with the monomyth, which is another one of these story structures. These are all visualizations, but in this one, this would be where it is, right here. Okay. Um, though usually in the Hollywood format, this is actually the shortest. Um, and then this one is, um, is mid-length, and this is the longest. Usually, okay? And so often you'll get to this thing and then it depends on, you know, Hollywood formula, you'll see the act three is kind of the, the big set piece. Whatever your big ending set piece is, is your act three, um, particularly in, in, the, um, in the action movie. But yeah, this is, this is your belly of the whale right here. Um, so that's one method of looking at it. it. There is a whole ton written about this formula um, because of the, the sort of screenwriting, they try to break it down, and they try to be very structured in screenwriting, say on this page, because a page correlates to a minute in screenwriting usually, so on page nine, you want this. On page 15, you want this. On page 30, you want this. Um, if you're writing a 90 minute movie, then you know this will be um, page 20, and this will be page 70, um, because you can kind of break it down that way. I'm not sure if those actual numbers are correct, but you, you can find things that will do that for you. It's simply one way of looking at it. Um, another way of looking at the same thing is the, um, the little scaling, scaling the mountain thing that you were taught in um, grade school. This guy, okay? Some people visualize their storytelling this way. Though really, um, as you become a better writer, the writers I've seen do it actually view it like this. like that. And what this one kind of uh, equates to is what we call the, the tri-fail cycle um, uh, model. A tri-fail cycle is, you know, you've got, you've got this monumental problem that we're trying to, to overcome, and we're going to try a number of times to overcome that, and each time we try, something is going to go wrong, usually outside of our own... Um, our own power, though sometimes it's because of our fatal flaw. It depends on what type of story you're writing. And then when that happens, you know, our progress is set back, um, things get worse, and we ramp up the tension to where we try again, and then again we fail. Progress is set back, um, and, and this sort of thing. Um, and Mary once described this to me, this, this sort of method, as the, um, um, the, the way you say, okay, your character gets up in the morning, and then what? Well, and then something goes wrong. Do they solve it? And you ask yourself, you, you say, yes, they solve it, but, it's a yes, but, or no, and. It's the yes, but, no, and method. Yes, they solve it, but something even worse happens. No, they don't solve it, and it gets even worse. Um, very simple story writing structure, but it is something to think, keep in mind. A good writing exercise is to try writing a short story with the um, the yes and no and yes but um, method where you, you have your character get out and introduce a problem and then just keep escalating it. Everything they try, you know, they got, what she described it to me, she got, they got out of bed and slipped on the floor, floor. Did they catch themselves? Yes, but, you know, in doing so, you know, they kicked the table and knocked off the thousand dollar Ming vase or something like that. Or... No, they didn't, and when they fell, they hit their heads and um, saw stars and um, were now in deep pain and maybe dying. You know, something like this. Um, and then you ask the next question and the next question. That's this method. Um, Dave, when he taught his class, said that for his plot structures, he liked to have someone fail twice for everything they attempt before they finally succeed. 
I don't know how to spell success. <laughs> There's like C's and S's in there, and I can never figure out how many of each one. Um, you fail two times uh, for every one time you succeed, and you also foreshadow three times before something becomes important. Um, that's Dave's, some of Dave's little rules. So you can kind of see that these are different ways of visualizing the same thing. Um, this one is more elementary, but sometimes that's what you need for a story. Um, both of these are focused on keeping the tension high. You want things to escalate. This is a basic plotting methodology is that things get worse. All right, you guys got these two? Because I'm going to throw another one at you. Foreshadow three times before an element becomes important. For instance, if a person's fantastic memory is going to be a plot point, you want to foreshadow or show them using their memory in interesting ways at least three times before you actually make it a plot point. That's Dave's rule of thumb. All right? And what about fail two times? They fail two times before they succeed. Before they succeed. At any given thing they attempt, um, they fail twice before they succeed. And once again, remember, um, oftentimes overlapping the character's <laughs> fatal flaw with these fail points is a good way to go about it. Um, you want to avoid making your character look hopeless. However, you'll notice that um, if you read Pat Rothfuss's writing, it feels a lot like he's doing something like this because Quoth will manage some great success, but then his fatal flaw, um, which is his arrogance or his temper, um, will then cost him most of what he's achieved and land him in um, equally deep water for his next um, adventure. He does this in the second one where he, you know, he, he saves the, um, the Maharaja's life um, from the assassin that everyone thought was him. And then he goes and insults the Maharaja's new um, wife because she, uh, she doesn't like the, um, the, the whatever they are, the... Yeah, I don't even know how to say it. The gypsies. Um, and she, he just goes off on her. And if, so, of course, instead of being lavished with wealth, his fatal flaw has meant that he's only gained a little bit. He now has a little bit of a patron, but this guy can't, you know, in order to not offend his new wife, has to kind of kick Quoth out and say, okay, you've got to go, like, solve this other problem for me and get out of here before she forces me to have you executed. Um, and so fatal flaw is therefore costing him. It's like, you know, three steps forward, two steps back in this sort of method. That's very much a yes, but sort of plotting structure, if you think about it. Yes, he succeeds, but he does something that, that get, then goes, makes it go horribly wrong. And it's not always close fault. Um, so the next one, as has been mentioned, is the monomyth. Uh, how many of you guys are familiar with the monomyth? We also call, also call it the hero's journey. Um, more hands went up on that. Hero's Journey is a circular so storytelling methodology um, in which this was described by many writers. Joseph Campbell is the most famous, but certainly not the first or even really the best, um, who talked about this. It goes back to Greek times, um, and the concept for this one is viewing a, um, a story as a circle. Um, this one, you start off with the, um, the hero, um, in a place of ignorance. Um, someone else is probably going to be able to do this better than I am because my, my hero's journey, I'm going to need refreshers. But somewhere along the way, he meets the impact carrier, character. Um, the impact character is the one who usually extends the call to arms. And then the impact character leaves. Um, usually they, they are killed. You said Joseph Campbell was not necessarily the best. Is there another book or any... Uh, you would have to go to the folklorists. They just tell me Campbell isn't the best because Campbell wasn't good at um, citing resources, ci doing citations and things. Um, a lot of my folklore teachers didn't really like Campbell because of that, because he, would, he, would, he did a good job of describing, but he didn't credit other people. And he, um, he then became like the big famous one for this when it was more of a body of work is what I've been told. I don't know that. I read here The Thousand Faces and I thought it was a, well, uh, a, a very useful book. Um, we'll, we'll talk about the foibles with it. But someone might um, be able to Google this and find out where I'm missing. But impact character called arms, impact character leaves, things go wrong, and we have what we call the belly of the well. Or the descent into the underworld. underworld. Is 
anybody have this up? Um, the hero's journey as the, as the circle. Um, so this is the low point for your character. You, you envision it as, you know, they have the call to arms and all this stuff. And in this one, I believe, this is the, you have the moment of decision where you really kind of take life into your own hands. You have the um, uh, defeat the evil. And then back up here, you have the return in wisdom to where you began. I'm sure I forgot something in there. Um, but the idea is with the hero's journey, um, you always end up where you began uh, for a true hero's journey. Yes? So there would be a lot of overlap between this and, uh, let's say, the three-act structure? I mean, yeah. Could... Oh, yeah. These are all ways of visualizing the same concepts. However, there are going to be slight differences. For instance, um, in the hero's journey, um, type of archetype, usually the hero is making their decision much later. Um, and this kind of harkens back to the ancient Greek structure where there's a whole lot of woe is me going on for, the, for a big part of the story until kind of the, you know, you have the call to arms, which is kind of a half call where you're like kind of accepting, but then, it's, um, then you kind of take destiny into your own hands and then you return with wisdom, um, having become a new person, having experienced the, the depths of, um, the absolute depths of despair. You've got it up. Yeah. yeah, I pulled it up, and it says that moment, they call it the atonement. The atonement, that's right. It comes after right. the transformation that went after you pass through the abyss. Right, the right, transformation. transformation, okay. Um, and then that first section there where, like, the, the impact the character yeah. leads, the hero passes through challenges and temptations and has helpers along the way. Uh-huh. Um, sometimes supernaturally. Okay, supernaturally. This is the, the gods are helping. Mm-hmm. And then there's like a line across the top that that whole top section is the known section. And oh yeah. Everything below it is unknown. Known and unknown. <laughs> okay. So I basically did get it. That I'm impressed by that. Um, <laughs> but it's because it's basically trying to describe the same sort of story. But the hero's journey actually has some very specific things to it um, that a lot of people then adapt and whatnot. And it depends. I mean. Um, if you like this storytelling archetype, the one thing that I warn you about is a lot of people who get into the journey, <coughs> hero's journey get into it so much that they start looking at it as a checklist for things to do in their story. Um, George Lucas did this. Uh, Joseph Campbell was a mentor of George Lucas's, and George Lucas actually did a s series of PBS specials talking about the hero's journey. Joseph Campbell did one, and then George Lucas did like the follow-up um, very deeply his student, like, um, he, he, he talks about this a lot, and the original Star Wars movies kept left out some of the things for the hero's journey, and so you'll notice in the prequels him trying to better align himself to the hero's journey. For instance, the virgin birth is a big part of the hero's journey and didn't exist in Star Wars until the new Star Wars movies came out where he wanted it, and I felt it was shoehorned in. It didn't fit the story he was telling, but he felt like, I need this because this is part of the true hero's journey, and he, um, so he put it in. And that's where you kind of run into trouble with any of these things, and when you're like, oh, I have to put this in because it's part of the archetype I'm working from, where these are really describing stories. You get that, that, that concept that Joseph Campbell described what a lot of stories had and brought together all the elements that were popular in a lot of them, but none of those stories have each of these elements. And so if you try to write a story making sure you hit each point on these elements, instead your framework becomes too rigid and you can, in, you're using something that was used to describe a story to then write your own story and so you're making a copy of a copy rather than using this to inform you and help you um, develop your own story more fully. And that's a thin line to walk but I think it's an important one to be aware of. Anyone else have anything to say on the hero's journey or any questions? It can be really useful, yeah. So, sorry. Yeah. Um, on the first one that you talked about, kind of yeah. some, but it's a little harder to describe. Like, when I'm thinking of introducing like characters, when you should have most of your characters introduced is probably Act One. Yeah. Oh, you can still introduce um, some characters in Act Two, but you basically may most of them by Act One, um, and this certainly. By the descent, that. you should have all of your um, all of your main players in, in place. Uh, can you go into a little bit more detail with the known and the unknown, and how um, the ignorance at the beginning? I mean, oh wait, these are yours. I can throw you one anyway. 
That was not bad. Yeah. Um, well, the concept of the hero's journey is really a, a, is about information. It's about the growth of a hero from innocent to wise, um, to the point that there's almost an invocation that the impact character, that the hero is becoming the impact character. Um, the impact character, by the way, is a screenwriting term of um, you usually have a, when you tell a story, you will often have an ignorant um, character beginning your story and someone will come into it who is kind of the one who's, who changes that person's life dramatically. Yes? I think Aragon is a really um, transparent example of this where it's obvious to see. Right, the hero's yeah. journey, yeah. Um, and there, there are a lot, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but yeah. That is, uh, the, the hero's journey is pretty, pretty, pretty visible, but that's, you know, so is it in Star Wars. Star Wars, it's really quite obvious with, um, with the hero's journey, and he makes it more and more obvious as the series goes along to its detriment, I think. Um, yeah. Also, one thing that I just remember hearing about this and the end of Act 2 is usually... Oh, yes, I caught it. Okay, is that, like, the hero is supposed to, like, think they're actually going to win, like, right before they hit the belly of the whale? Is that... Right, that's, that's common. Um, yeah, the it, it, you, yeah you you don't have to do that, but it certainly is a good um, plot archetype. The yes, we've got this. Um, it's kind of the the the, the calm before the storm. Um, everything seems to be going all right. We're doing okay. Um, I do these often in my books uh, because it feels like a natural breather to take, and then bam, bam everything goes crazy wrong. My question is, you know, how I mean, you talk about this? We don't follow these strictly because. Often, as I read a story, yeah. I get bothered when it's like, oh, I, he's a poor orphan farm boy raised by some not family member who bad things happen, he goes off on a mystical adventure. It happens in like so many yes. novels that it gets boring. Mm -hmm. so I, was, I was just kind of curious as to, do you purposely try to deviate from this sort of I do. journey? I do. And like, in what sort of ways do you try to do that? Um, <laughs> I try, sometimes I do, I do the whole po postmodern thing. Like in Miss Porn. Postmodern, by the way, not meaning postmodern, but really modernist, where it's self aware that it says, okay, I'm building upon this framework, and so I'm therefore going to deviate from step one. You know the framework, I'm going to evoke it in early scenes, and then I'm going to go horribly wrong. Um, that's something I do. Mostly, though, I just go on instinct. We haven't gotten to the way I storytell yet, I don't use any of these. Um, these, are, these are academic ways that I think are useful for describing it, and they are very useful for some. Howard uses three-act very religiously. Dave uses the, um, the, the try-fail cycle thing very religiously. It tells good stories for him. We haven't hit what I do yet, and maybe when I explain to you what I do, it'll help you. Uh, maybe, maybe I should just wait for you to kind of explain yeah. anything, but I mean, I'm really looking like, how do you know when you've got this great plot? Is it you just really enjoy reading it yourself. Yeah, we'll. Th I'll tell you about that. I, I'll, I'll tell you how I view it, and that might help you. But all right, we'll um, we'll we'll go on, and then maybe at the end we'll have more questions after I've kind of described mine. Um, by the way, Orson Scott Card has a great one called the Mice Quotient. Um, have any of you guys read Mice Quotient? Um, I will just send you to do it. Mice is milieu, um, idea, character, event. Am I right? Um, and his. You can read his essays on it. He does. I can't do it justice in this amount of time, though. We did a writing excuses where Mary explained it quite well. Um, but my quotient is: you decide for a given scene or novel or short story whether it's a milieu, which is his word to make it fit the um, acronym, which means um, means setting, a setting story, a character story, an event story, or an idea story, and you then begin by leading with that character, if it's a character story, and then you end with that character's um, change. That's what the, the hero's journey basically is. But for science fiction, you lead with an idea and you end the story when the idea has, what is it? I didn't even know um, mice that well. But anyway, go, go read it. Um, it's, it's worth looking at. Um, I should be better at mice than I am, but um, I've never, it took me a long time to wrap my head around mice, and I still don't quite have it. Um, if I sat down with it, I could figure it out. Um, what I do is um, I look for a sense of progression.
Um, my experience has been in storytelling that what keeps people moving through a story is that progression. And what stops people is when they lose the sense of progression. And this is an interesting revelation for me to have because these things are actually all fairly arbitrary. They come into your storytelling skill as a writer. However, as a writer, you can make, you could write a thousand page book that takes place in one minute. You could. Or you can take, write a thousand page book that, that crosses 30,000 years. You could write a 15 page story that crosses 30,000 years. So progression in any of these things is all in your hands as a writer. Your job is to give the reader the, the, the clues that the story is progressing so that they feel like there is motion through the story. And this is my main goal, is to make sure that there is always a sense of motion, that things are progressing through the story, that we're building, we're moving towards something. And in order to do that, I divide my stories in my head up into different types of plots. Um, and I then, when I'm doing my outlining, I look at these plots and I decide what is going to make an effective sense of progression for these plots. Um, as an aside, one thing that, that gave me a, a, an understanding of this was reading um, Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell's book, Inferno. Um, Inferno is about a science fiction writer who gets drunk and falls out a window, dies and wakes up in Dante's Inferno, in the hell as described by Dante, right? And there is a map in the front of this book. And I thought, why does the Inferno need a map? That's just like a cliche, he's a fantasy and science fiction writer, so they put a map in. And yet, as I read this book, the book was basically a series of vignettes happening in the different places in Dante's Inferno. It was with the same character, but it almost read like, a, it read very episodically. You get to this new area, you kind of have an adventure there, and then you leave that play area and enter the new adventure, it, it, new areas, very episodic, and yet, I felt a strange cohesion to the whole novel despite that. And I realized that was because I was feeling like there was a good sense of progression because I could follow along on the map where they were and where they were going. Um, so I began to study this and see that the great travelogue, um, there might be two L's in that. Um, let's pretend there are. Um, but, uh, the travel log is a plot stop type. And if you identify that you have a travel log, which is character starts in point A and across the story is going to go to point B, um, Lord of the Rings has very much has a travel log plot structure to it. Now, we'll get to the fact that most books are going to have multiple plot structures. But one of the plot structures of Lord of the Rings is a travel log. David Eddings wrote enormous travel logs. Okay, uh, the first few books of the Wheel of Time were travelogues. And what happens in travelogue is you do have a lot of episodic adventures. And it seemed to me that that map was therefore a way to give us a sense of progression while we were having episodic adventures along the way. And Often, it seems to me that a book just full of episodic adventures could feel somewhat boring. And yet, if you feel you have this, this main goal, and you can look at that map and you see, oh, here's the kingdom of Gromush. Gromush. The great. <laughs> and we're starting here, and look where we're going, and it's right there where we have to get to, you know, throw the, the magical earring into the... Um, the, the, the pit of, um, of something, the, the pit of slime, that's right. <laughs> totally not a Lord of the Rings ripoff. Um, if you can see this progression, this gets lessened. The fact that it's episodic, and you can enjoy each episode along the way because they are points along this map getting you where you're wanting to go. And it therefore creates this sense of progression is one type of plot archetype. So... I started to look in trying to identify major plot archetypes and decide what methodologies people were using in order to, um, in order to create that sense of progression. So you've got, these are just some I've identified. You guys might be able to identify more. 
Um, but I, send, I tend to look at Travelog. I don't really write these because I think they have been used quite a bit in fantasy and epic fantasy. Um, and so I stayed away from them intentionally because I felt they just were used so much. And also, episodic adventures don't interest me as a writer as much as the um, staying in one place and build to a, 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 an enormous climax, um, which, though, cost me this sense of progression there. So I have to use other methods to ha get a sense of progression. So, um, mystery plots. The mystery seemed to be um, that often I was identifying in stories that there would be something that needed to be discovered, and the sense of progression along the way was clues. Um, blues clues. Um, that, if you say, you know, blues clues is pretty obvious about it, but if you say, we need to discover this, and along the way, you then break down in your plot, these are what our clues are going to be, and you start doling them out through the course of the story, then suddenly you have a sense of progression happening for your reader as they feel you're, they're getting closer and closer to discovering this big event. Um, the Da Vinci Code has one of these, and it really annoys me because I think he does a bad job with it. <clears throat> but he does also do, um, he uses a lot of dirty tricks that make it very effective, despite me not really enjoying it. Um, so the mystery, clues along the way. For this to work, you have to look at it and say, this is a mystery. I must identify to my reader up front that this is our goal. This is what we're trying to discover. In screenwriting terms, we call that hanging a lantern on it. That's where you say, pay attention to this. It's important. Um, you often hang a lantern on something that um, your reader might think, wait a minute, I think that's an error. If you then have your character say, wow, that's weird, that shouldn't be. Then the reader says, aha, it's not an error, it's a plot point. Um, it, that's a very useful tool to know. But the mystery, you've got to hang a lantern on the fact that there is a mystery. Make it a central focus of your plot. Most whodunits are this. Someone has been killed, we don't know who the murderer is, therefore we are going to go through and investigate and slowly find out and eliminate... Um, the possibilities until we end up with the person who actually did it, right? Um, and so, sense of progression there. Um, other ones are the relationship subplot. Um, this can be romantic or non-romantic. They actually play out very similarly, um, which the relationship is based on Two characters becoming friends and or um, more than friends, depending on the story you're telling. And in that, again, you have to give a sense of progression. It doesn't always have to be forward progression. Let's keep that in mind. Um, but when I am building a story, early on I'll say, okay, looks like we have a relationship plot here. What kinds of things can I put in the story that would be conducive to giving a sense that this is progressing? Right? And I actually build those things in. Um, some of these ones are, have to work a little more organically for the way I do my writing. So I'll, I'll come up with these things, but I, I'm not as specific on relationship um, issues because it is so character intensive. And for me, um, I have to know the characters before I can figure out how they, they'll react to some of these things. But it is still very useful to say, okay, I am going to, for instance, for a relationship plot to work, um, the characters have to be stuck together for one reason or another. And so you can build into your plot points where they are stuck together for one reason or another. And you can show that motion of them getting along better and better or hating each other more and more until they then kill each other at the end of the story. All right. Um, no, no, no. Yeah. Is the mystery one? I think I like listened to writing excuses once, and I'm trying to remember there was one, like, I don't know if that's... Okay, that's not that. But like, it's like the time bomb. Yeah, we're getting to the time bomb. Oh, sorry. I'll get I thought the time it bomb. might have been this. Nope, we're getting to it. Um, big problem is another one where you just introduce your big problem, and we need to figure this out. Um, most heist plots are actually big problem plots if you look at it. Um, if you go watch, um, if you go watch Inception again, or The Sting, or something like this, they introduce a big problem. We have to achieve this almost impossible thing. And then they show you them breaking it down and working on the pieces. 
breaking it down and working on the pieces gives us a sense of progression. We, in order to, um, to, to rob this place, we first need to acquire an EMP. How are we going to get it? Well, let's go send these guys to pull off that part of the heist and get the EMP and bring it back. And then we have this one piece of the plot, which we have told the, the, um, the viewer, this is Ocean's Eleven, by the way, up front, that we are going to need. And now they will get a sense we are moving inexorably toward our goal. Okay? And they get it, but he they, hurts his hand. Yes, they get it, but he hurts his hand. You're right. Nice job. Um, so... The other thing that I'll mention is, um, is the time bomb, um, which is actually, I've come to, to decide, not a plot archetype, but is one of the things you can use to inspire a sense of progression on your story with, if none of these other things are working and if it's appropriate. This is the, um, oh, I used it in Elantris. Um, not even really knowing what I was doing at that point, but you have you know 100 days to achieve this, otherwise this horrible thing is going to happen. If you're having trouble getting a sense of progression to your stories, you can always do this, something like unto this. It doesn't have to be, you know, but it, it's a time bomb. Um, you, have to, um, you have to spend all of your money by the end of this certain period, and if you do, you'll get even more money, and if you don't, you'll be left broke. That's Brewster's Millions, which is using a time bomb plot with a big problem, basically. But it's really more of just a time bomb because they don't even, you know, there's no breaking it up. It's just we have a million dollars, we have to get rid of it, and then you watch the million dollars slowly tick away as they move toward the ending time-wise. So I guess it is really a big problem. It's just an easy one. We have a million dollars, we have to get rid of it. <laughs> Let's keep count. Um, is it a million in Brewster's Millions? It's probably... 30, he has to get rid of 30, and then he wins more. Yeah, something like that. What's that? Yeah, they have stipulations on what you can do with it and stuff. It's a fun movie. It's Richard Pryor. You guys haven't seen Brewster's Millions? Yeah, this generation, the classic movies. Um, but no, um, that, the, the time bomb works very well for certain um, storytelling archetypes. Has anyone seen 24? Every episode ended with a ticking clock. Or even every, every uh, commercial break had a ticking clock. And in 24 hours, you knew something horrible and awful was going to happen, and we, you were just trying to keep it from happening. Um, and, and it works very well. So the whole concept with this is this progression. And this is what I look at. I identify what types of these archetypes. Usually I have some of all of these. Uh, not as many on the travel log, um, and there are other ones to identify. You can split big, big problem into subsets. It's just how you want to look at it. But then I break it down and say, let's come up with ten steps. That's arbitrary, but whatever works for you. That this can be divided up into. Um, let's come up with ten steps that you know we can see in this relationship, and I will actually make four of them steps backward, and six of them steps forward. This sort of thing, so we get a sense that the book is moving along. When you pick up a thousand page novel, it's really important that you give people a sense that things are moving along. And um, it was really hard to do this in Way of Kings because um, I forced upon myself a lot of um, big external boundaries um, and, and things like that. But anyway, there's what it is if you want to do it easily. Um, just pick one of them, say this is the main plot of my book, break it down, introduce it in chapter one or two, um, then introduce the pieces that your character is going to work on, and then slowly achieve them, but add in the yes buts, and let things escalate. Now, questions? Yeah? Um, what's your opinion on the uh, seven plot that uh, Dan and Rob really like? I'm fine with it. Um, I mean, it's, it's another way of describing things, um, but I don't use any of these things. I just use this one of mine. Basically, I like how all of them describe the way things work, but I, I feel, even though I'm an outliner, I feel too locked in um, by a lot of those types of plots, um, plot things like the seven-pointer or things like that, and I feel that I don't necessarily want my plots to fit into these archetypes quite as easily as they sometimes do in other books. 
which was mentioned over here, the worry of that happening to you. Um, you can find your own way of approaching this. People say that there are only a certain number of plots, and I suppose that's true. Um, but part of writing, part of what we're doing, is try to explore things in new ways and add something to the dialogue and not just tell the same stories that have happened before. So I do get a little apprehensive when people follow any one of these things too much. But at the same time, you know, everyone has their own process. And these things help people write good stories, so therefore they can't be bad. It's good to use them. They just don't work for me that well because they, uh, it makes me feel like I'm coming up with things that are a little too generic. But if I were writing a screenplay, I would use three-act format straight down the line because Hollywood likes its screenplays very tight and ordinary. Um, and then you just hope for a good director to add that life into it, which you know, some of them can. Uh, Dark Knight does not really follow this, any of these archetypes really well. Um, it certainly uses some of the principles, the yes, but, um, and no sort of stuff it uses. It, it, but at the same time, when you think the story is done, it's not, which is great. That's why I like, one of the reasons I like that film so much.